So one of the really interesting parallels of Almost Famous and Green Book is that they both uh, look back at someone's past. And I think Betsy had such a difficult job in that not only did she have to be truthful to the time period, but she also had to recreate something um, in this movie, in Cameron Crowe's mind, and then in Green Book, in the son's mind, of, as a memory of his father. So talk to me about that nostalgia and trying to, how, how do you recreate something that's a memory well, I think we can all agree that a lot of times our memories are larger than life. And both of these jobs, but let's talk about Almost Famous, is honoring people's memory. Then as costume designers, our job is to make something that's real into something that's cinematic. And as we all in this room know, it's not the same thing. So. The fortunate part is that Cameron had all his reference from when he was on the road with the Eagles and Led Zeppelin, and our friend Joel Bernstein had all the reference of a 1973 Neil Young tour. So you start with the reality. There was the reality, and then you look at like Bianca Jagger, and you know, you look at the people of the, of the time, and it's kind of like what I said in the little thing that was on earlier, you kind of have to be comfortable enough in the period you're working in to set yourself free. And you don't want to uh, imitate, you want to emulate. And then suddenly, you know, the doors fly open and you say, oh, look, there was a big craze of vintage in the early 70s. I think like, and then, and then you get like really, I get very like, a plus A equals B. So I say, okay, there's a lot of vintage. But in 1970, the vintage they had was 40s and sometimes 30s. They went back that far. So let's do Anna Paquin. She was kind of like a squirmy kind of young girl, her energy, the polexia. I said, let's give her the 30s silhouette. Let's make her some dresses that, you know, define that character would be right for the period. and. And so, um, does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> um, talk to me about, I mean, talk to me about the trying to get the truthfulness of the pieces and, and trying of distilling those photographs. I mean, how, how do you look at that, all that, that reference material and make it into that? Well, you know, it's like I say, I try to find something in reality. And I think you and I talked about, there was a guy that worked for Neil Young, and his name was, sadly, Larry Johnson, because he's no longer with us. And he worked on Woodstock. And he was also kind of under, you know, under the radar. And I was looking through the photographs of Joel Bernstein, and I saw a picture of Larry Johnson uh, backstage in the dressing room. There was nobody in there but Larry, and he was standing sort of in the back of the frame, and he was looking just right into the eye of the camera, and there was something so separate and lonely about Larry, and yet he was there. He was clearly comfortable there, and I said, it's William, and there was something in that picture that said William to me, and then Patrick Fugit comes along. He doesn't look anything like Larry Johnson. He's not built like Larry Johnson, nothing. But, you know, that was my inspiration. And that's how I weed through it. I just look at it all. I mean, I could see a guy who's driving a tractor. And I could say, oh, yeah, that's my hero. My hero should look like a guy who drives a tractor. So I just no, and I think, you know, when you see those kinds of direct correlations, that's what kind of has that thread of truth and possibility for each of the characters. So when you look at them, it's entirely believable. And that's what makes it so marvelous. I mean, like Penny Lane's vulnerability, you know, wrapped up in that coat that became so iconic afterwards. I mean, nobody had that coat. That, and th where did that coat ha ha tell us about that? It's a rug from Urban Outfitters and some fabric from... Uh, Michael Levine Fabrics, uh, upholstery store. But, you know, I think we all know 
that it has a lot to do with who's cast in the part. And when you see Kate now, originally Kate was going to not have the curly hair. Well, you see, you've got the curly hair, and I was around in those days, and I, there's just something so angelic about her. I needed the curls, and it was, it was a bit of a tiff with the makeup and hair department, but I won, and Cameron liked it. So then once you get that hair, that blonde hair, then you know where you're going with the coat. And we were, there were a lot of references. I know this sounds weird, but there's a picture I saw of Jack Lemon and Shirley MacLaine from the apartment. And Shirley MacLaine, it's one of the ones where they're sitting on the sofa, and she has on a coat with just a little bit of fur. It's nothing like the Penny Lane coat, but then I thought about her character and how she was so vulnerable, but pretending that she was like, like I'm a hooker, so you know, you can't upset me. And that was my inspiration. So then you have the actress, and she's so angelic that you want the halo. You've got the hair, and the collar is the halo, and then I wanted a little activity in the back so when she walks up the ramp and looks over her shoulder and, you know, she's, call me if you need a rescue. I just wanted a little something flirty. And so the detail was in the back, and the front was just protection. And how memorable it has been. And you know, even looking at it this evening, I just kind of marveled that it was as good as I remember. That's so fun. Thank you, but you know also, John Towell, our cinematographer, who's still working, is, uh, he's like, they just doesn't come any better. And he and I spent a lot of time on that fur collar, all the different colors, all the different dips, just of cream, to get the one that was going to bounce the light off of her face. Because you know when you put somebody in a white blouse or anything white, it's going to bounce the light off their face. It's good. And we wanted just a certain kind of light, like candlelight, like mellow light, 70s light. And um, I think we, we went, I dyed a lot of those rugs before I cut the one. You know, no, I cut a lot of them and we put them on her and we photographed them with her. And we found the one that worked. I think you have to, I know the answer to this, but I think you have to tell anyone, everyone how much of the film you actually built. Because oh, so... Everything but the blue jeans. We did, uh, Lucky Brand did a run of Henleys for us, and we dyed them all different colors. And may I also pay my deepest respect to Michael Dennison, who is also not here with us, was my costume supervisor, and honestly... You couldn't ever have anybody better, you know, to have your back. And that was the kind of movie where I didn't have an assistant costume designer, but I had Dixie. And, you know, so um, we did a run with Lucky Brand because I was friends with those guys. And then we made all the T-shirts because we needed them to fit right. You know, we needed the boys' T-shirts to fit like girls' T-shirts. We needed the scoop necks. We needed the bell bottoms, you know. Um, we printed them all, everything you saw, Detroit sucks, all that. We put all that on. We did a run of Black Sabbath t-shirts, which I don't know if you could see or not, for the people outside the forum, for the Black Sabbath concert. We, know we must have made about a 1,000 of those. So um, everything on the principles but the blue jeans I made, all Penny Lane's blouses, all the girls, and all um, Jeff's shirts and Russell's shirts and... The drummer who doesn't speak wears the Henleys. Those two guys were real musicians. And um, that's just an, as an aside, a, a parallel to uh, Green Book is that Mahershala Ali learned to play a little piano and Billy Crudup learned to play a little guitar. But there's movie magic in there that makes you think that they both did it all themselves. Tell us about Jeff's t-shirt because that's so much fun. <laughs> I don't know if you notice in the end when they deny the story and he, Jeff Beebe is going crazy because, you know, he's embarrassed to be who he is. And he, at that moment, is wearing a T-shirt of himself. <laughs> and that was inspired by one of Neil Young's T-shirts. And Neil was, I found a picture, in, in, again, in Joel's archive of Neil Young wearing a, that T-shirt. But it was Neil Young's face on it, and Neil Young was wearing it, and I said, Cameron, Cameron, we have to do this, <laughs> and I have the perfect place for it, and that's, you know, so it just, you know, I don't know, once you get in the flow, yeah. So 
working when you I, I have a question that kind of goes to Green Book too. When you first got the script for this, did you immediately want to do it? How did you feel? Well, I have a relation had had a relationship and still have with Cameron Crowe. And we had done Jerry Maguire together. Um, he had wanted me to do his first film and I didn't have enough uh, credits or credibility for the people making the movie, so I didn't get the job. And then just by coincidence, when he was doing Jerry Maguire, it was a producer, uh, Larry Mark, who I was working with quite a bit. So that was just a kismet. And we got along really well. We approach things the same way. We have a, a rock and roll past. We have some, like Joel Bernstein's both of our friends. And um, you should check out his photography is amazing. Um, so we had that relationship. So when you have a good relationship with your director, you, you don't care what, you just say yes. I mean, they can call and tell you, I'm photographing the ladies room and you say yes. There was no, like, I'm reading this, I, do I want to do it, don't I? As Cameron calls up and says, now I'm doing this. I go, yes. One of the things I think is really fun about your work is, um, and this goes to Reservoir Dogs or Pulp Fiction um, and this film, is that they all have had a lasting impact in, you know, in pop culture and in fashion. And um, I love that, um, you know, like Quentin says, you guys always win Halloween. Yeah. And that's kind of part of my, like, stealth idea. It just kind of, it, it captures the imagination. Like, it's so right. It's so subtle. It just captures the imagination of the audience. And the audience believes it. And nothing detracts. And that's what makes it so wonderful. That's kind of the spell. And I think that that's a really good thought to bring us to kind of to to Green Book because I feel like there's there's a lot of parallels there's the music parallel there's the personal story parallel there's the fact that you're capturing the memory and I know that you wanted to do the script when you read it well that was those were not my people mm -hmm. I heard about the movie and Green Book and I I wanted to be in the mix and um that was before I even read the script. It was just the idea of the movie and Viggo Mortensen, and I don't know. I just sent the voice in my head. It's like you said, you tell me how I always intuit the things. Well, I intuited that one from a distance. Have you all seen Green Book? I, sh I sure hope so. Um, talk to me about the dynamic of those two characters and, and your research process to create them. Well, I was lucky. Again, I had the real research. Um, Nick Vallelonga had pictures of his father working at the Copacabana. He was there with Tom Jones and Don Rickles and all these people. So you saw that look and you saw the people in the background and of course Frank Sinatra and, and then he had pictures of him, his family and pictures of his mother. So that was very good groundwork you know, for inspiration. And then at the same time, when I was looking through uh, Bill Owens, I, I like his photography, and I was looking through one of his books, and there was a man, he was just an older man with a ball cap on his head, sitting on, the, on a cement, uh, like, you know, by the steps, it was like a little wall, a lower wall. He was sitting there, he had a cardigan on, and I said, oh, there's the dad, not Tony, the family, um, it's hard to I get confused because the family in Green Book, three of them were the actual family. So Frank was playing his father, but in reality, he was the little boy in the movie. And his uncle was playing his grandfather. I mean, that, so it's like it's very confusing to me. There were three. All the ones that were always talking Italian, those were the real family. And they were they were in the in our movie playing their parents or their uncles. You, you have to tell us about the fitting. Oh, so yeah. So I saw this guy in the picture. I thought, oh, this is a great look for this one. You know, and then you know, and Barbara Marco, who's here tonight, she helped me put a lot of this stuff together for Green Book. Um, and we were racing around making pack making these little packages of characters. We never met these guys for the family. And I ended up mixing it all up. But they all came in from the East Coast on the same day, at the same time, to work the next day. 
and they didn't get in till 7 p.m. And they all showed up, and they're elderly. You know, they were elderly people. And, and they all came at me at the same time, and I said, all right, everybody in. You know, I didn't do them one by one. I said, okay, you try this, because we had it all bundled up with their names on. You, know, you try this. Oh, you're not really that size. You take his. You know, I just, I just fit them all at the same time. And then one by one, they would just, you know, put these clothes on, and these, they'd look in the mirror, and then, you know, they said, yeah. Yeah, this is something like my dad would wear. I, could, I was, like, so excited. <laughs> No, I think that's like the ultimate compliment. I don't think it gets better than that for them to say that that, it, just striking that note, is it's difficult. And with a group of people, I think that that's just so amazing. And then the oddest thing I was telling Anna happened two nights ago. We had a little Green Book get together, and there was a fellow there who um, handled uh, Don Shirley, the doctor, Dr. Shirley's estate. And he said to me, it's just uncanny I have all his clothes, and it's just uncanny what you did. If things were like actual things, he would have worn. I mean, I could show you his clothes, and you would be surprised. And I thought, wow. Because all I had to go on was the guy's album covers. I looked at all his album covers. I had a picture of him in his tuxedo with his trio, and I had a picture of him in his apartment in Con Carnegie Hall that I found online, and he was wearing a crazy robe. Not anything like the one I did, but you know that was all I had to go on. And again, the rest was Mahershala. You know, and as he and channeled, some intuiting, what? and some intuiting. Yeah, but you know, we all know this is that they come in. You've got the character now. Here's the actor, and we all know this that you're messing around. You're trying to figure it out, and when it's right, they're happy. You're happy. You know, you're like, yeah, I think some things happening here. I think this could be good. And that's the moment that we're hired to produce that nobody seems to understand but us. <laughs> um, I love, when I was watching the film, I loved how the characters started to rub off on each other, you know, and at the end, you know, they, they come as close as they possibly can be. Can you talk to me about that? Because I, I know that you did it 100% on purpose. That's the whole story, isn't it? I mean, we can find common ground. That's what this story is about, is that you would be surprised. The scene, I mean, for me, it begins, this changing around begins in the scene in the stairway of the hotel where Mahershala, Dr. Shirley, thinks that Tony Lip is going to leave him and get paid more money to go work back with these gangsters. and. And, it, and he's also, at that point, discovered that Dr. Shirley is a homosexual. And Dr. Shirley thinks, oh, he's going to leave me. He's going to abandon me. And the, the surprise in that scene in the hallway is that Tony, who's like this guy from the Bronx, he's like a real redneck, he goes, no, Doc. First of all, I made a deal with you. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. And secondly, I'm in show business. I've seen everything. And you as the audience kind of go, wow. This is a surprise. You know, this, this is a surprise. And it suddenly you begin to see, and it's a surprise to Dr. Shirley that now Tony Lip's the smart one. <laughs> you know? And so that's how it begins. And um, just, I just wanted by the end, I just wanted Tony in the back seat, wrapped in Dr. Shirley's blanket, and Dr. Shirley driving him. And that just says it all right there. You, you know, I feel like you think I'm stealth, and I appreciate it, and thank you. And I've just had really good fortune with the scripts, with the writers, the screenwriters, the writer-directors, because when you have a character who's complete and whole on the page, they leap off the page and tell you how they look. They tell you who they are. And that's the secret of my success. Who made the boots, the floral boots? Oh, the what's this? Willie. Willie. The question, who made the floral boots? Yeah, those are the boots that she wears in the, at the plaza? Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't think you were the only person. That kind well, of Oscar De Laurenti knocked him off. You could have you could have gone and bought some. <laughs> yes. I, I was just wondering, Betsy, what was the budget? How does the budget on a film like that start? Where where do you start with the budget? Oh, I think we spent five hundred thousand dollars, which I think in two thousand that was a really good amount of money. Um. How do I start? I don't, you'll have to channel Dixie. I mean, I intuitively know. I think some of us, you, you know, you read the script and you can't really break. I don't really break it down. But if they say, we have, you know, forty thousand dollars, like what? Reservoir Dogs, ten thousand dollars. I was like, yeah, I can do it. You just. Yes. When it comes to finding like your inspiration and just being able to collect information, what is your favorite source and what you feel like makes you connect to the characters more? For research, you mean? Yeah. Oh, gosh. It's horses for courses. I mean, I think the th most thrilling part about this job and the reason I've been able to stick with it is because every time it's different. And every time there's something else to learn, and every time you've got to go somewhere else to find what you're looking for. Betsy, you've had a really good career because you have designed a lot of movies that we still really care about. And from all of these movies, do you have a favorite in terms of the costumes, or do you have a favorite in terms of the overall movie, or do you have more than one favorite? Well, until Green Book, you saw it tonight. And um, no, hands down. But, but now, the message in Green Book is so powerful and so right. And working with those guys, they were so wonderful to me, just totally off topic. My mom passed away while we were shooting Green Book. Don't get out your hankies. She was 96. I mean, I love her. I miss her. But Mahershala and Vigo heard about it. And on a work day, when they were shooting scenes with dialogue, they both called me together to pay their condolences. And, you know, it just starts, I mean, these are the most amazingly committed people who so appreciate what I brought to the party and continue to appreciate what I brought to the party that that could be my new favorite. Yes? How do you feel when an actor says, I want to do this or I have an idea about doing it this way and you're not feeling it? How do you handle that? Well, I do feel it, because they're the ones that have to do it. Um, flexibility is the key. You know, we have to do it together, and I'm always willing to try it. It's really not, I don't mind. The actor can ask me for anything. It's when other people, <laughs> those other people. No. <laughs> the older I get, the less tolerant I am. I'm sorry. No, but honestly, um, you know, when I worked on Out of Sight, when I designed Out of Sight, and um, Jennifer Lopez was very new, and she came to her first fitting with a bunch of fashion magazines, and I had a few pieces in the room, and she had an idea, exactly what you're saying. She had a very specific idea, and she held up the magazine, and I said, oh, I mean like this magazine? We had all the same things, and I listened to her, and she told me everything she had to say. And I said, all right, well, obviously, I don't have that here today. But in the meantime, I do have a couple of samples here. Would you just mind? They're just samples. Can you just see so I get an idea of how you know, these things would fit, how you, you know, fit into clothes? She loved the samples. I never heard another idea from her again. And I got, you know, I was lucky. That's a master class right there. Everybody get your pants. <laughs> I love that sheer blouse mm -hmm. uh, in the one scene where they're speaking kind of in the wooded area. So that blouse, I happen to have this fabulous um, stitcher in the workroom on Almost Famous. Her name is Alice, and she used to work for Jimmy Galanos. So she could do that blouse. I mean, not everybody can do that blouse. And the point of it was that this is a moment, it's very sheer, and she is feeling comfortable enough to be transparent. 
only to find out that she's been sold for a case of beer and $50. So that was the thinking behind that blouse. So it really underscores kind of the poignancy of the scene, yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay. Oh, good. Thank you so You're much, You're more than welcome. Betsy. Thanks for Thank coming. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.